Um, okay, so uh, good morning and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Emily Hull. I'm from the University of Alberta in Canada. And my presentation today will continue on the theme of previous presentations, a reindeer-themed morning. Um, and I will be covering some of my in-progress research on pathological and osteological differences, both large and small, between ecotypes of Rangifer tarandus, establishing a baseline that exists in wild animals so that we can look at anomalies that happen in domestic or managed animals. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors, as well as the experts who have selflessly and generously given their time, energy, and expertise in helping me learn, and especially two who are in this room right now who have been so fundamental to um, my experience. Um, uh, and I would also like to thank the staff at L'Hôpital d'Atoua for allowing me to CT scan a caribou in the middle of the night, and also Charlie in Geneva, who gave me free time in his internet cafe after my laptop died and without whom I would literally not have a presentation to give you today. Um, for reference, I am coming from a theoretical background of animal agency-based backgrounds with a focus on human-animal relationships. Um, as my research is focused on differences between ecotypes of reindeer and caribou, it's important to give some background on the species of Rangifer tarandus and why the ecotypes of the species what the ecotypes of the species are, and why they matter in the archaeological record. Rangifer tarandus, who are collo colloquially known as caribou in North America and reindeer in Europe and Asia, are a circumpolar and a circumboreal species with innumerable and often debated subspecies, but with three globally occurring ecotypes, which despite the vast differences between them, share similarities in size, behavior, herd composition, and habitat. As we currently understand it, these ecotypes formed through parallel evolution as groups of reindeer and caribou, caribou underwent ecological niche adaptation into woodland or forest ecotypes, which is the largest ecotype, um, tundra or barren ground ecotypes, and arctic ecotypes in arctic environments. My research focuses primarily on the differences between tundra and forest ecotypes, as these have had the most historical interactions with humans. Skittish forest reindeer are larger. They live in smaller herds generally, um, and in more forested, often mountainous terrain. Uh, they have been hunted by peoples in North America and in Skidinoscandia for thousands of years. Tundra reindeer have also been hunted, but their relationship with humans is more complex. Um, and it's important to note that these ecotypes overlap in size and are difficult to differentiate in archaeological assemblages. Um, tundra reindeer tend to live in much larger herd groups. They migrate further distances in general and live on the tundra and barren ground areas of the north. While no caribou have ever been domesticated in North America, ancient and modern peoples of Europe, Asia, and North America followed the migratory routes of tundra herds often influencing these migratory routes for their own purposes. In the Yukon and Alaska, caribou fences were used to funnel and corral um, herds of barren ground caribou. Um, and in Finoscandia, herding, as we have heard, eventually led to uh, pastoralism um, and domestication. And it's important to note that all domestic reindeer in Finoscandia are tundra ecotypes. Forest ecotypes have never been domesticated or, or herded in either North America or Finiscandia. So that's a pretty big difference. So these ecotypes are distinguishable in life from one another and have different relationships with humans. So what's the archaeological issue? Unfortunately, archaeologically identifying these ecotypes is actually kind of challenging. Um, reindeer, first of all, don't show a lot of the traditional markers of domestication that we see in other domestic animals, such as cattle, goats, and sheep. Um, reindeer, I just said that. Um, <laughs> um, and even though forest ecotypes are generally larger than tundra ecotypes, as I said before, there is overlap in size. Um, this difficulty is compounded by the manner in which we typically find reindeer remains. Um, which is in commingled multi-individual assemblages of processed bone. 
This makes it hard to determine if a fragmented bone belongs to a butchered domestic tundra deer or a hunted forest deer, or if the assemblage is a combination of both. Reindeer are also usually processed for secondary bypass products such as antler, which is distinctive between subspecies and complicates this matter further. Additionally, as landscapes change, we can't depend on modern localities to determine the ecotypes of historical reindeer. Forests move, humans move, humans move animals, animals move humans, and animals move themselves. So despite these difficulties, um, ecotypes have much to offer us in zooarchaeology. First, they give us clues to what relationships a group of people were having with reindeer or caribou, using animal behavioral patterns to help understand or clarify human ones. Secondly, in an era of climate change, ecotypes can give us an insight into regional paleoecology. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, studying ancient animals is a reward in and of itself, as we gain insight into the personal lives of individual non-human persons, herd dynamics, migration patterns, and the health and welfare and how these have changed over time. So how do we counter the issues of ecotype identification in zooarchaeology? So the research I'm presenting today is in two areas. Differences in rates and types of trauma and differences in habitual activity as seen through enthesial changes of the phalanges, which seems to be a theme in this session. Um, with pathology, as is seen in study of South American camelids, animals are in different environments are subject to different injuries. For example, a forest reindeer walking down a rocky slope is more likely to injure a hoof or a leg than a tundra reindeer walking on a flat, barren ground area. Humans also influence these patterns. Humans preserve and are often protective of animals, but humans are also quick to kill injured, weak, or compromised animals. As for habitual activity, this study focuses on reindeer hooves, and as, been, as was mentioned by um, Dr. Minamaki, um, it is taking uh, inspiration for earlier studies by doctors Salmi and Ninamaki um, on reindeer engaged in different activities, as well as again taking inspiration from studies of pathological lesions and South American camelid feet. So first, pathology. So the pathological sample, first of all, these are from the Zoological Museum at the University of Oulu. Um, there were both domestic Rangifers rennes, rennes, which is a tundra ecotype, Wild Rangifer Tyrannus finicus, which is a forest ecotype. They're all modern individuals. We assessed 131 adult individuals, both sexes, but only ended up analyzing 101 adult samples who have the most clear data for sex for being as an ecotype. Um, I, additionally, I've analyzed all of the available complete or mostly complete caribou skeletons at the Canadian Museum of Nature. Um, these cover wild individuals of all three ecotypes and are supplemented with additional caribou housed at Washington State University. However, the rubric used on the finished sample has not yet been applied to these. So, the finished samples were assessed with a focus on major traumatic injuries, but all pathologies were noted just for comparison. The rubric for preliminary assessment were divided into five groups. First was ambiguous. These included samples where taphonomy or potential post-mortem damage made assessment inconclusive. No pathology included um, individuals who were completely healthy. Minor pathology were small pathological lesions, minor osteoarthritis, and other age-related conditions. These were noted but were, are not going to be the focus of further assessment as other people have worked on these much better than I ever could. So my focus was on the major pathology and in injury, which included broken bones or limbs, um, fusion of these broken bones or limbs, major sites of infection or deformation. And the last section is trauma as cause of death. This was where the trauma was paramortem and listed as the direct cause of death. While many of these were vehic vehicular accidents, some were dramatic and almost Shakespearean. Um, one unfortunate forest reindeer's cause of death was listed as, quote, starvation, comma, fell off of a cliff, comma, eaten by beast. When you remove the ambiguous and fatal injury data, the pattern becomes even more clear with the major pathology of forest reindeer and the major pathology of tundra reindeer. The pattern becomes very clear that um, uh, forest ecotypes are experiencing much greater rates of major trauma primarily limb breakage. 
um, while the more minor age-related pathologies appear consistent. Um, the levels of trauma are so extreme that we can anticipate that major skeletal pathology is a major factor in the lives of woodland reindeer. Most of these injuries are of long-term duration and occur in either in the long bones of the hind limbs, the phalanges, or both. Fracture with evidence of healing and long-term use is common. While this data does compare modern populations and may be influenced by animal husbandry of domestic reindeer, initial findings from the wild Canadian sample appear to show the same pattern, with barren ground and arctic animals experiencing less gross trauma than their woodland cousins. They are more likely, however, to have a cause of death listed simply with two words, polar bear. After completing the analysis of the North American samples according to this rubric, my research plan is to analyze the gross trauma by type, anatomical location, and injury duration. I also plan to analyze the prevalence of major pathologies according to sex. So the implications of this. Um, so the associations of certain pathologies with specific ecotypes can help us have a not definitively define an ecotype in an archaeological assemblage, but the percentage of long-term trauma may give us a, a clue as to what percentage an assemblage is a forest reindeer, especially with the great divide in pathologies between forest and tundra reindeer. And this, in turn, can give us information about ecology, migration, human hunting, and animal husbandry practices. So next, in these changes, um, so this research is on change in the phalangelium theses, is inspired by and done in collaboration um, with Dr. Salmi and Ninamaki, whose work on reindeer and theses, uh, Siurva just um, talked a bit about, um, and is primary and fundamental to this book. So, um, as we've sort of established what an thesis is, this study aims to establish a baseline difference in the minute connections in reindeer toes as different terrain, movement, and foraging activity may result in the increased development of different sites. Um, to this point, we have undertaken data collection stages of this research and scored um, our entire finished sample. Um, so that included initial identification of sites of entheses, cross-checking these sites with dissection, um, development of an identification matrix to identify thoracic versus pelvic phalanges, an establishment of an ordinal scoring system, and then scoring the entire sample. While further analysis remains, initial findings do support that there are differences in some indicial, in indicial changes in certain sites according to ecotype, but we need to dig deeper into this information to find out exactly what that, that means. Um, so uh, the future plans uh, are a potential addition of North American materials just to counter that domestic wild division. Um, just looking at sex and ecotype, adding working animals, and again, looking at animal size for comparison. So why phalanges? Um, the phalanges are important bones in zooarchaeology uh, of reindeer because first, they're often recovered intact from sites as they have little soft tissue to entice omnivores like humans or carnivores like dogs. Um, the hooves are used differently in different terrains, and hooves are used in foraging and thus differentiate, used differently by foddered and unfoddered animals. Um, and determination of habitual hoof activities can help archaeologists distinguish between ecotypes as well as wild and domestic animals. So thank you kindly for your attention. Um, if we have time, maybe some questions. Um, but again, thank you very much. <laughs>